as I said, we'll present an overview of financial performance in the annual report and accounts that landed just before Christmas. I'll also highlight uh, previous two years, prior years, to show trends and how things have moved. And we'll also include some projections for the current year, clearly unaudited, looking at our revenues, looking at costs, looking at profitability, and looking at our balance sheet. Having said all that, the story of the accounts uh, in 2016-17 is relatively simple. It's the first year of an amazing new TV deal, which will see four pounds out of every five that we earn coming from the central Premier League TV deal. It's a year when we've seen some significant uh, commercial growth, and it's a year when we've seen consistent full houses, waiting lists, caps, and season tickets. It's a year also when we've made substantial investments in new players and a big increase in our wage bill, and we've also had phenomenal significant support from our new uh, majority shareholder. In a nutshell, that's the story of the 1617 accounts. Moving on in a little more detail to look at revenues. As I said, broadcast revenue, the first year of a fantastic new TV deal underpinning that record turnover. It's not that long ago that TV revenues accounted for around 50 million pounds, and over the course of five seasons, TV revenue has virtually tripled. Probably most significantly is the fact that for every league place, there's nearly two million pounds on offer for every place on the table in prize money. There's also 1.1 million for every live TV pick. So every time we're on TV, on live, home or away, it's over a million pounds, which is comfortably more than the gate receipts we get from any Premier League fixture at Goodison. Match day is a very simple story and I think a very impressive story. Um, it is that story of season ticket record sales, of caps on numbers, of waiting lists, of a real tangible commitment to affordable pricing. We've extended concession bans. We've got more and more young fans into the stadium. So one in four of our season ticket holders are young fans under the age of 22, which is significantly more uh, than our rivals. The consequence of all of that is a declining yield per seat. So in terms of how much we're getting for every seat, uh, for every game at Goodison, that has gone down. And that's a reflection of our commitment to young fans. The chart in the top right presents the really impressive information on capacities on uh, season ticket numbers. It's not that long ago, if you can see on there, looking at where we were in 2011-12, uh, and we're significantly further on from that. So all the hard work that's gone into this means, I guess, simply that it's no longer easy to get a ticket at Goodison Park. Our commitment to affordable pricing, I think, is there for everybody uh, to see we've extended concession bans and I think as everybody knows we're extending the price freeze into 2018-19. Our top price season ticket is the fourth cheapest in the Premier League and for the seventh season in a row junior school kids can watch Premier League football for £5 a game as part of a £95 season ticket so a real continued commitment to affordable football. Commercial revenue Apologies. Commercial revenue has grown significantly. In the current year, um, a record-breaking deal from USM to be followed by equal record-breaking deals to re be reported in this year's numbers from Sp Sport Pacer and Angry Birds. Sport Pacer all, also allowed us to chalk off another first. As you saw in the video, we're the first English Premier League team to go and play in East Africa and when we played in front of 50,000 fans in Dar es Salaam. The Angry Bird deal got everybody talking. The sports industry, the sports sponsorship industry took note and we're delighted to be working with such a young, creative and globally recognized brand. I should also, again, as it was referenced in the video, say thank you at this point to Chang for all their support over 13 years. And we're delighted that Chang is staying with us as a community partner. Putting all of that together in terms of total revenue, well, record-breaking turnover underpinned by that fantastic new TV deal and then bolstered in the current year by those uh, record-breaking commercial deals, and not least, uh, despite an early exit, around eight million pound contribution from Europa League football. I think everybody knows uh, where our money goes, given that clear sense of purpose and what we're all about. Our money goes onto the pitch, and the next chart will show you uh, what's happened to total wages and, and other costs. Our investment in players has seen wages increase, the forecast for this year, to 140 million that will represent more than 70% of our turnover, which is something we need to monitor and manage closely, uh, despite it not being massively out of kilter uh, with our Premier League rivals. Another cost that we have to manage and be determined to keep on top of is other costs, but other costs includes 
uh, a number of areas, general overheads, normal business running costs, along with some um, exceptional items. The general overheads are things like rent and rates, maintenance and utilities, etc., etc. You can see a long list of uh, different costs. But as I said, that other cost figure also includes this year some exceptional items. They include the cost of changing managers and backroom teams. They include the cost of repaying the prudential loan early, which I'll come on to. And they also include the significant advancements we've made and money we've invested in the new stadium project, which to date we're not able to capitalise and won't be able to capitalise until we get a, a planning permission. So we need to keep a tight rein on costs, and I talked before about uh, the new Everton and the availability of resources. I'm not sure everybody believed me when I used to say that 85p in every pound we spent ended up at Finch Farm. That final financial pressure to some extent has been relieved, but what we need to do is make sure that the strict financial discipline that went with it hasn't. We've also spent heavily, as I'm sure everybody will know, in the transfer market. And the next, the next chart, this chart, explains our net transfer spend over the past seven windows. In really simple terms, you can see that for every one pound we've received from the sale of a player, we've spent two. We've invested almost 340 million pounds over seven windows, with half of it recovered through the sales of Lukaku, Stones, Delafue, um, and Naismith. So substantial investment in new playing talent. That uh, player trading impacts our profitability in two ways. For the players on the top half of the diagram, then it's the amortization, the write-off of their transfer fee over the life of the contract. For the players on the bottom half of the slide, for the sales, then it's any profit or loss we realize on their disposal. So moving into profitability next, the next chart really shows that there is no real pattern or trend in profitability. The earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization line, which essentially is before player trading, is heavily influenced by those exceptional items, by the costs of changing managers and the investment in the new stadium project. The line underneath it, the net profit line, essentially is a reflection of the player trading, the profits we've made on the sale of Lukaku and Stones, netted off of the cost of writing off the transfer fees of all the players we've signed. Okay, so moving into our balance sheet, it's a different looking Everton balance sheet at the end of uh, May 2017. We still have the same recurring uh, issue, if you like, of understated assets. And you look at our playing squad and it is significantly understated. What is good to see is the insured value relative to the book value remains high, remains positive. What's also really good to see on that chart is the young players on there, the young players that are probably on our books at nil or very limited values. And I think we'll all agree that the emergence of that young talent into the first team squad in the first half of the season has probably been uh, our biggest success of the season to date. And we should pay tribute to the work of our academy and David Unsworth in particular in, in that respect. Our balance sheet has also changed from Mr. Mashiri's substantial investment I talked about on one of the early slides. His investment has allowed us to repay all long-term debt. So the prudential loan that sat on our balance sheet since 2003 has been fully repaid. That saves us around three million pounds every season uh, in interest charges and repayments. In terms of overall indebtedness on our balance sheet, well, three things to really emphasize on this chart. At May 17, at the year end, uh, besides amounts that we owe to other clubs for the purchase of players, no overdraft and no debt. Also at that same date, Mr. Mashiri's investment with no fixed repayment date and no contractual obligation to repay is shown in equity rather than in liabilities. So at that point, we have a healthy shareholder fund balance of over 90 million pounds. The significant spending we did in, summer, summer, in the summer of 2017 on players, however, means that we have additional new facilities with ICBC and Santander. Overall, um, the financial position at Everton with the support of Mr. Mashiri, we feel is very healthy and very strong. Mr. Mashiri's investment has also allowed us to push forward on other areas. Substantial upgrades at Finch Farm, and I'm sure uh, all the redevelopment um, at Goodison Park that we've all seen, the way that Everton looks, particularly under floodlights right now, is amazing, and, uh, and the investment has, uh, is there to be seen. We've also seen um, the big investment in players, and we saw on a previous slide the difference between what we'd spent on players and what we've brought in. So Mr. Mashiri's contribution has also had a major difference there. 
We've also pushed forward and made significant advancements on the new stadium, securing the land and making initial progress on design and planning application. So the next um, section tonight is to really give an update um, on where we are with the stadium. Significant resource, time, commitment, and as you've seen, money has gone into the new stadium project. We remain absolutely fully committed. We remain very optimistic, but there are still some big hurdles for us to overcome, not least finding all the money for, which, for what will be a significant financial commitment with long-term lasting uh, implications, consequences on the football club. Where are we going? I think everybody knows where we're going. We're going to Bramley Moor Dock, which is a site that commands a substantial premium, not just the cost of the land, but the cost of preparing the land for a new stadium. But of course, it's a site that comes with fantastic commercial opportunities and upsides, upsides that our business plan continues to work on and reflect. What are we building? Well, there are some outline designs done, outline designs that were done to inform our costs. But the most important thing we need to do next is consult with you, our fans. We're convinced that, the, uh, that, that our vision is one that you will endorse, and that's a stadium that will challenge the way new stadiums have been built over the past two decades. A stadium that very firmly puts football and the fans first. A stadium that's very firmly atmospheric and intimidating, and we'll hear a little bit shortly from Dan Meese on some of those qualities. How much? Well, it's an escalating cost. It's a cost that continues to grow, but it's a cost that we continue to try and manage. Of course, that increase in cost is stretching our funding target all the time, which leads on to what has always been our biggest single challenge, which is how are we going to pay for it? Well, I'm delighted to be able to say that we're getting very close to securing a major funding deal with Liverpool City Council. who have been great partners with us over the past 12 months. But around two thirds of the total project cost, we are optimistic will be met by support from Liverpool City Council in a deal that makes great sense for the council, that delivers a very healthy return to the council, but most importantly acts as a catalyst and a springboard for all that fantastic regeneration, new jobs, new homes, new businesses in North Liverpool. What's next? Well, what's very important to us, to, for, what's very important to us is to confirm Liverpool City Council's support. With two thirds of the funding in the bag, then the attention turns to the final third and work's already ongoing looking at how we're going to uh, find the money for that final third. We will then move into a consultation, and I'll talk a little bit very soon about how we will frame that consultation. We're already advanced making preparations for a planning application, and as I said before, our business plan is constantly reiterated, looking at opportunities, but also looking very closely at cost and risk. When will it be ready? Um, we anticipate and we hope a year for design, a year to secure funding, and a year to um, determine a planning application, all obviously operating in parallel. That will allow us to start working around a year's time with a three-year construction period on what is a challenging site to build a new stadium. If everything goes to plan, to be in there uh, kicking off in August 2022. Committed, absolutely. Optimistic, yes, but you know, the enduring message, I think, is there's still uh, challenges for us to overcome. As I said, an important next stage for us will be to embark on consultation uh, with our fans. So giving you the chance to have your, port, your input and build the stadium that we all want uh, and we all want to build. In that respect, listening to all the informal feedback we've had from you over the last 12 months, listening to uh, industry experts, visiting Stadia all over the country and overseas, we've developed some core principles which will help frame uh, the dialogue with you and frame the feedback in terms of the attributes and features we want from our new stadium. First of all, we absolutely want it to be our fortress, intimidating, atmospheric, a place where opposing teams hate to come. We referenced before the £2 million per league place, the most important revenue stream in our business plan will come from finishing higher and, up, higher, and higher up the league. To make this a truly home fortress will be really important in that respect. That's number one priority. Number two is to make it a home, a home that's readily loved, uh, often visited, fundamentally a stadium that everybody, I think, feels very proud of. So it's very important that it's adopted quickly um, and easily. Of course, uh, one of the real drivers, the real driver behind the move is to create a platform for growth. So to be able to realize those waiting lists, to be able to introduce new commercial partners, to host new events, essentially to remove the constraints, the commercial constraints of Goodison Park. 
It needs to reflect our values. It needs to reflect everything about the People's Club. It needs to be able to, and we will, um, maintain our commitment to affordable pricing, not take advantage of perfect sight lines or the absence of pillars. We need to maintain our values. It also needs to be a landmark, something that befits, enhances, complements our world-famous waterfront. Fundamentally easy to get to and easy to get home from, something we probably take for granted at Goodison, but something obviously so fundamental to any sporting event or sporting venue. Truly, we'll never leave Liverpool 4, and Denise will talk a little bit about our powerful legacy programme. We won't be leaving uh, Liverpool 4, we will leave a strong and powerful and enduring legacy. It needs to respect uh, the environment in the sense of respecting the rich maritime history of the city and the docks. It needs to enhance the environment. It's in a unique environmental location. Technology will be a big part of it. Connecting communities on a match day, allowing us to entertain and transact, but also to act, to act as a technological hub on non-match days, bringing a wider community together, together through technology. And finally, as I said, it absolutely has to be the right deal for the city. Uh, it has to be a deal that generates return, relieves pressure on council budgets, but as I said, also acts as that springboard um, for the regeneration of North Liverpool.